Welcome to Ground School USA Session 4 of our Instrument Pilot Ground School. I am Derek Metro. Glad you're joining us for this one. In this session, we'll be talking about regulations, or FARs, that pertain to instrument flying and the instrument knowledge test. As you know, the FARs are divided into parts. You remember part one is all about the general definitions. Part 43 specifically tackles maintenance, and in there also you will find what preventative maintenance is, what pilots can do, what private pilots uh, can do on their airplanes. Part 67 is the medical standards. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about medicals and medical durations a little bit later. Uh, part 121, air carrier operations. 135 is charter, so we're really not dealing with those at all. Uh, but 61, which is all about certification requirements, and part 91, which is the flight rules. Those will be the two uh, major areas that we're going to look at uh, in this session. Of course, the joke is part 61 is how to get your license, and 91 is how you can lose it. All right. Let's go and look at some 61 regulations. Uh, part 61 is divided into subparts. Subpart A is the general section. Subpart B goes through aircraft ratings. And then C through J deals with all kinds of different pilot certificates like the student pilot, the recreational, sport, private, and so on and so forth. Um, we're just going to go in sequential order here. The instrument rating, no person may act as PIC of a civil aircraft under IFR or in weather conditions that are less than VFR unless that person holds the appropriate category, class, and type if type rating is required. We're talking about a type rating there, you know, aircraft that are way over 12,500 pounds or a turbojet. And you have to have possess a instrument rating for your pilot certificate that goes with your airplane, helicopter, or powered lift, whatever aircraft uh, you are flying. So you have to be appropriately rated for the aircraft. You also have to have an instrument rating that goes with that uh, aircraft. 61.3 says an IFR clearance is required when operating above 18,000 feet. That's anytime you're in class alpha airspace, which goes up to 60,000 feet, by the way. Uh, and then 61.5 covers the different certificates that can be issued for pilots, student pilot, sport, recreational, private pilot, uh, many of you are sure private pilot, uh, commercial pilot, flight instructor, or ATP. These are certificates. Notice you did not find an instrument pilot in there, did you? That is because the instrument rating is an add-on to the certificate of a private or a commercial uh, certificate. So it's not a certificate in and of itself. It's an additional rating onto a existing certificate. Uh, ratings that can be issued under Part 61 in terms of the type of aircraft that you can be rated in, and that breaks down into category and class. This is 61.5, paragraph B. Uh, airplane is the category that's broader than a class, and underneath class is underneath the category. So within the airplane category, we can have single engine land, multi engine land, single engine C, multi engine C, those four for rotorcraft, it's helicopter and gyroplane, lighter than air, airship or balloon, and a glider is a glider is a glider. There is no further class distinction for a, a glider. And then we also do have powered lift, powered parachute, weight shift control categories. And again, there's no specific class on that because they're pretty. that's pretty narrowed down already as it is. Uh, so those are different types of aircraft uh, ratings that we can be issued uh, in terms of category and class. And then 61.5, paragraph B8, instrument rating, again, for just the private and commercial certificates. Uh, you can be instrument rated uh, in an airplane. You can be instrument rated in a helicopter, or you can actually be instrument rated in a powered lift. 61.31 uh, talks about, just through this in there, because it's good for us to remember that we also have to be not only... Uh, given a category and class designation by the FAA, but if we plan to fly a complex, high-performance, pressurized, or tailwheel aircraft, we don't need another rating or an additional category and class or a type rating or anything. We just need some additional instruction from a CFI and a sign-off in our logbooks. That's what these four uh, require. Uh, maybe you've gotten some of these already yourself. But a complex airplane, just to refresh us if you don't remember, is an aircraft that has a controllable pitch prop or constant speed prop, right? Uh, retractable landing gear and flaps has to have all three. A high performance airplane 
is anything over 200 horsepower it has to be greater than 200 horsepower so it can't just have 200 horsepower always remember flying the Piper arrow that was exactly 200 horsepower somebody made a little design flaw I feel like with that it should have been a 201 horsepower engine right so we could sign everybody off for their high performance pressurized aircraft you have to have additional instruction if you're gonna fly a pressurized aircraft and then a tailwheel aircraft uh, same thing more specifics can be found in 6131 on these uh, four type of sign offs medical duration uh, requirements and duration um, some people are wondering about medicals they still are required uh, however if you're flying a sport aircraft you might be able to actually just use a driver's license you will you can um, there are some operations that do not require medicals they now have something called basic med I'm gonna go over that in just a minute and the, the this discussion here really is not on the written test any longer but it's still good for us to uh, go over I feel like and if you rather you can kinda skip over this part here but for some of us maybe it's been a little while since we've looked at medical requirements you'll still find them in 6123 uh, first class medical is required if you're going to operate as an ATP airline transport pilot so if you have that certificate level and you're exercising your privileges as an airline pilot um, you have to get a first class medical if you're under 30 that's good for 12 calendar months uh, if you're over 40 six months and you'll have to get another one um, if you don't and you're just operating as a commercial pilot you may let that first class lapse and it'll become valid as a second class or cover commercial pilot uh, operations but that's still only good for 12 uh, calendar months as a commercial so to fly for hire in any sense you have to have a, a second class medical and that's good for 12 months for any age group then the third class medical which covers everything else if anything other than an ATP or a commercial pilot you would operate with a third class medical uh, if you're under 40 they are good for 60 months that's five years if you're over 40 24 months 24 calendar months now interestingly a flight instructor can actually use a third class medical while they're operating as a flight instructor a little stipulation and there's several other stipulations you can get the full uh, treatment in 6123 uh, we're not going to go over that but I do want to introduce something that's uh, fairly new as of about a year ago it's called basic med and it began May 1st 2017 and uh, you can operate without an FAA issued medical here's the stipulations uh, you can fly an aircraft that's got no more than six seats uh, maximum you cannot carry more than five passengers uh, at a time uh, you can operate VFR or IFR anywhere in the United States, uh, but it has to be within the United States. You have to stay below 18,000 feet, so out of class A. Uh, you cannot exceed 250 knots, and the flight cannot be operated for compensation or higher, so you can't take money uh, for a flight. If you do that, you need a medical. Uh, and then your maximum takeoff weight of your aircraft is uh, 6,000 pounds and so if you can keep to that criteria you can operate under a basic med you don't need to have an FAA issued medical now the requirements to do this you need a US a valid US driver's license uh, you need to have held a FAA medical certificate at some point after July 14 2006 so you have to have had a medical at least once you cannot be a student pilot and grab a basic med um, you have to have gotten a medical from the FAA at one point after 2006 you have to obtain a physical from a state licensed physician so that might be your own physician and you do have to take a basic med uh, educational course online AOPA offers that the FAA.gov website also talks all about this as well so you can get more information there okay logging instrument time 6151 uh, you can log actual or simulated instrument time in your logbook. Actual or simulated. Actual means going through the clouds, going through what we call IMC, that's instrument meteorological conditions. So when it's less than VFR, when the ceilings are less, when you're in the clouds, uh, when the visibility is less than VFR and you're in actually instrument conditions, that's what we consider as actual of course as an instrument student pilot you would need to have your instructor uh, with you to do that
but you can also log instrument time that is simulated. So that is if you're wearing a hood and you have an instructor next to you or you have a safety pilot, uh, you can log instrument time that way. You can also do it in a simulator or a flight training device, but you do need to log the approaches, where you were, the airport, the location that is, the type of approach, whether it's an ILS or a VOR approach or a GPS approach. And if you're doing it simulated in the airplane, that is you're wearing a hood and you have a safety pilot, you need to log the name of the safety pilot in your records. You have to put them in the records. Of course you need to be in VMC conditions to do simulated uh, IFR flight. Now 6157 talks about recent flight experience. How do I stay current as an instrument pilot? So in order to act as PIC under IFR, that means in actual conditions, okay, uh, you must have logged in actual or simulated instrument flight in the last six months at least six instrument approaches holding procedures and intercepting and tracking courses via navigational systems that one should not be hard because as long as you're intercepting a course whether that's the final course inbound to a runway uh, or you're getting on an airway uh, you're tracking a needle that's intercepting and tracking a course via a VOR or a GPS for example would be the most common. Uh, you'll learn how to do holding patterns and of course approaches are something you have to keep pretty nicely polished as an instrument pilot. There's a lot going on there and it's a high workload uh, environment. So at least six approaches, holding patterns and um, intercepting and tracking a course uh, in the last six months. And again you can do that in actual conditions as long as you're still current and or you can also do that in simulated instrument uh, flight but it has to be in the same category of aircraft that category that we talked about earlier so if you're rated for airplane it's got to be it's got to be in an airplane but it's not class specific notice it just talks about the airplane category uh, and again you can also use a simulator or flight training device with a CFI now what's the difference well a simulator is a full motion if you have a simulator at your flight school that's stationary uh, that's a flight training device you might have a PC based one but it has to be endorsed by a CFI you cannot just go in and work on a simulator or a training device and say I did six approaches or I did three approaches log it and sign it off as part of your currency uh, if you're going to do a simulator or flight training device it actually has to be a CFI um, who endorses that now let's say those six months slip away from you and you don't quite get all the requirements in.